can't get here on time, Pastor. Just get here when you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's <laughs> rich? I want love. I was here before you. I got called out. Oh. <laughs> okay, guys. See the principal. <laughs> The prayer request I was going to share is my mom, they took her to the hospital yesterday, and um, she was diagnosed months ago with congestive heart failure, getting weaker, but she's had some kind of sickness, and then she's got, I don't know the name of it, it's a skin infection, you get in your leg, she's got it in her legs where it's like they just swell and the pus runs out of them and stuff, but uh, she's at the point my dad was having to help her walk. To the bathroom and she's probably double his weight um, and he's got issues with low blood pressure and dizziness a lot anyway so uh, not a good thing but they took her to the hospital and they kept her to see if they can figure anything out so, okay. okay pray for her when you have a chance all right awesome yes yeah. absolutely all right <laughs> gospel of john chapter 17 we're going to pick up where we left off Last week, and last week we were talking, we left off, we were talking about how Jesus' entire life was focused on glorifying his Father. He, everything he did was focused on glorifying his Father. His prevailing focus had always been on glorifying his Father, perfectly submitting to the Father's will in everything, even to the end. The events of his birth brought glory to God as did his teaching, his miracles, and that's where we're going to pick up today. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. So again, we see he's doing a miracle and it's bringing glory to God the Father. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. <coughs> verse 31. Matthew 15, verse 31. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So once again, we see here's a miracle, and it's glorifying God. Go to Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2, verse 12. Mark 2, 12. <laughs> Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So once again, we see his miracle. It's glorifying God. Go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5, verse 25. Luke 5, 25. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So again, we're seeing these miracles, and it's bringing glory to God. Luke chapter 7, verse 16. Luke 7, 16. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. God has visited his people. Go to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. Luke 13, verse 13. <coughs> And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Glorified God. Luke chapter 17. 
Luke 17, verse 15. Luke 17, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Jump forward to chapter 18, verse 43. 18, verse 43. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So we see here that his birth glorified God. His teaching glorified God. His miracles glorified God. Also, his death and resurrection. Go to Gospel of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. I want to look at verse 23. John 12, 23. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So again, we see here from <laughs> beginning to end, Jesus' life was all about glorifying his Father. His focus was all about glorifying his Father. Now, is Jesus an example to us? Yes. Then we should be doing the very same thing. Everything in our life should be focused on glorifying God. Do we all face tough decisions in yes. life? Absolutely. What is one way to determine what God wants us to do? Pray. That's one way. What's another way? Read God's Word. Read God's Word. That's another way. What's another way? Seek godly counsel. Seek godly counsel. There you go. What's another way? What's another way? You have to make a tough decision. What's a way to determine? And all those are correct. What's another way to determine... Which way should I go? I just talked to my wife. You just talked to your wife. <laughs> I usually don't have to talk. I just listen to my wife. That's another good. There you go. There are two good, good reasons. Very good. Very good. Anything else? I got this. Connecting with God's people, I would put. Absolutely yes. Related to what? He has yes. Said. Absolutely. What else? There's another one in there. All those are great, and there's still another one. Yeah. Serve and see where God works. That's true too, yes. And what's another one? Will the decision you make bring glory and honor to God? Will that's what Jesus did. Everything he did, everything he did was focused on glorifying his Father. Every decision we make, one aspect, and everything you said was true, but another aspect, think about it. If I do this, will this bring glory and honor to God? And let that help guide you into the tough decisions we have to make. But everything we, we saw Jesus' life from beginning to end, it was all about glorifying God. Our lives should be the same thing. And every decision we make and everything we do, we should be focused on, okay, will this bring glory to God? If the answer is no, then we don't want to do it. It's the wrong thing to do. If it will not glorify God, we don't want to do it. In absolutely everything the Son had submitted to the Father's will. Go to Gospel of John chapter 6. Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 38. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. But the will of him who sent me. So and now we see here, Jesus was focused on doing what God wanted him to do. How do we know what God wants us to do? How do we know what God wants us to do? 
What do you How do you guys determine, okay, you know what? I need to do what God wants, and this is how I determine what God wants me to do. How do you figure that out? You know the Word. The Word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? How do we determine? And you know what's interesting is um, listening to your wife, asking your wife that if she's a godly woman, that's a smart way to go. I mean, God gave us our wives as helpers, and there's, I think it's wise to go to your wife and ask her advice. I have no problem with that. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes you have to, to try a step Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Absolutely. You also need to be in constant prayer. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Your relationship with the Lord has to be where it's supposed to be. It has to be there, or you're not going to get what you want as far as what does God want me to do? Because He's going to be focused on if there's sin in your life, you got to have to deal with that sin before you're going to go anywhere else. He's going to stop you cold until you deal with that sin. But again, we see here. Jesus was totally focused on God. He was focused on glorifying God, and he was focused on doing what God wanted him to do. Not what he wanted to do, but what God wanted him to do. That's what his life was all about. And again, he's our example. He's the one we're supposed to be following. Focused on glorifying God, and what does God want? Even during his passionate prayers in Gethsemane, when the temptation to abandon the cross was at its peak, Jesus submitted to the plan of God. Go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. We'll look at verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. 26:39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, when I read that verse, I want to read it one more time. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, when I read that verse to you, what does it say to you? What does that verse say to you? Share with me, what does that verse say to you? He's leaving it all up to God. Leaving it all up to God. Okay, absolutely, yes. Anyone else? What does that verse say to you? Yes. You can ask God anything. Absolutely, yes. There's nothing we can't ask God. Mm -hmm. What else? What does that verse say to you? Anyone else? Yes. And we're human, and when Jesus was praying that, he was in his human state, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we would prefer not to have pain and sorrow and uh, go through all those trials and tribulations, but you know what? Sometimes it's best. And we have to leave that up to God. And But we can ask God to take it from us if it's His will. Yeah, yeah. But if it's not His will, then we we got to be willing to bear it. Absolutely. Sometimes in life, hard times are going to hit. Hard times are going to hit. That does not mean we're out of God's will. That does not mean we're out of God's will. Now, we should be asking him, you know, all right, why is this happening? What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do? But understand, just because hard times hit, and we see here, here's something in Jesus' life that he did not want to do. He did not want to do this. But yet, if he asked, take it away. But whatever you say, I'm okay with that. And we need to understand there are going to be things come in our lives that God is asking us to do and we're not going to want to do it. And it's okay to say, Lord, I don't want to do this. It's okay to say that. But then surrender to whatever he tells you to do. If he says, no, I want you to do this, then that's what we do. But understand, I mean, and I see it on TV that, oh, you know, there should be no problems in your life at all. If, if you're a child of God, it's a paved, gold paved road. That's not true. That's a lie. We see here in Jesus' life that things are going to happen to us that we're not going to like, we're not going to want to do. But he's telling us to do it. And he knows better than what we know as to what we need to be doing and what the overall outcome will be. Yes. He always, is, always grants us peace. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if you're if you're not in sin, yes. But if sin comes into your life, you're not going to have peace until you you repent right. of it. Okay. Okay. So we see that again. We see in Jesus' life, 
He's focused on what God wants, not what he wants. Because we see here in that verse, he clearly did not want to do this. He did not want to do it. But if it's what God the Father wanted him to do, he was going to do it. And we need to be the same way and understand that life is not just a bowl of cherries. Sometimes they put okra in there. And it ain't, if you don't like okra, then you understand what I'm talking about. But you like okra. Okay, well, forgive me. I'm a northerner, and I ain't real crazy about okra. I can't help myself. I don't like cherries. I love cherries now. Oh, man, on a banana split, that ain't nothing better than that. Well, oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay. Just as the Son had glorified the Father... So the follower, whoops, just as the Son had glorified the Father, the Father had glorified the Son. Now, does the same thing apply to us? Does the same thing apply to us? When, when our lives, we live our lives and we're doing different things that glorify God, does God glorify us back? What do you think? Does God glorify us as he glorified the Son? I mean, not necessarily the same way he glorified the Son, but does God glorify us when we glorify him? I say yes. Say yes? Okay. He Anyone blesses, else? He blesses us when we obey him, and by obeying him, we glorify him. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Does God glorify us when we glorify him? What do you think? He gives us much more fruits. Okay. 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 Anyone else? What do you think? Does God glorify us when we glorify Him? Anyone else? I think you need to define glorify for us. Well, we looked at how does He? How did He glorify Jesus? How did the Father glorify Jesus? We we read a lot of things here. How did the Father glorify Jesus? When you when you read the Bible and, and we've seen this, how did the Father glorify the Son? In all these things that Jesus did, how did the Father glorify the Son? When Jesus did a miracle, he was glorifying the Father. How did the, glorif how did the Father glorify him when he did that miracle? When he died on the rock, on the rock, on the cross, <laughs> when he died on the cross, how did the Father, that glorified the Father, how did the Father glorify him? How did the Father glorify that when he died on the cross, that glorified the Father? But how did the Father glorify him? I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, but uh, it, it brings in people. It changes their hearts. And, to, and it, you know, the Father gives Jesus us who okay. Okay. follow him. Okay, okay, okay. When you witness to someone, okay, is, would you agree that when you're sharing the gospel with someone, that's glorifying God? Would you all agree with that? When you're sharing the gospel, that's glorifying God. How does God glorify you in return? I'm sorry, go ahead. I say he gives you a, a story <coughs> of peace eternal. Oh, okay. 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 Anyone else? Anyone else? Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. <laughs> verse 37. Thus Jesus could say to his opponents. John chapter 5 verse 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. I'm taking for granted everyone in here is a believer. If you're not, please see me after class. Do you know God the Father? Do you know him? Remember, here, Jesus is talking to people who don't know him. They don't have any idea who God the Father is, but Jesus does. Jesus knows him. Do you know God the Father? If we know Jesus, we know the Father. Okay. So, would you not say that God is glorifying you by allowing you to know him? Yes. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? That it is 
God is glorifying you by allowing you to know him. Does everyone on the planet know God the Father? No. All right. Do people on the planet choose who's going to if they're going to know the Father or not? Do they choose it? I can't get away from it. I'm sorry, but we can't escape it. We can't. That's it. Who chooses if we're going to be saved or not? God does. Is, is God not honoring us when he does that? Is he not honoring us when he does that? So God the Father does honor us. Understand, he honored the Son, he honors us. He honors us us. Is it an honor to be a child of God? Absolutely. He's honoring us. Just as he honored the son, he's honoring us. Understand, that's part of our relationship. That's part of what Jesus accomplished for us. And later, go to John chapter 8, verse 54. John chapter 8, verse 54. John chapter 8, verse 54. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say he, that he is your God. He is your God. Now here are people that were claiming that God the Father was their God, and he was not their God. He was not their God. And you saw that in, in their actions, and Jesus made it clear that, yes, he honors God, and God honors him. And the same thing applies to us. We need to honor God, and he will honor us. At his baptism, the father audibly affirmed his approval of the son. He made it very clear. This occurred a second time at his transfiguration and a third time shortly before his passion. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 28. John chapter 12, verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Again, the importance of glorifying God. Every one of us, every aspect of our lives, should be about glorifying God. And guess what? That's just not what we do. That's just not what we say. That's just not what we don't say. It's also our thought life. It's also our thought life. And hence, the importance of staying in the Word of God. Staying in the Word. The importance of spending time memorizing Scripture. Fill your mind with the Word of God. Let the Word of God be your thoughts. And that is glorifying God. That is glorifying God. Every aspect of our life should be about glorifying God. Every aspect of it. Every aspect of Jesus' life was about glorifying God. Every aspect of it. The Father further demonstrated that Jesus was truly his son through his miracles. Go to John chapter 2. Gospel of John chapter 2. Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we see here he's doing miracles and he's manifesting himself as the Son of God. John chapter 9, verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 3. John chapter 9, verse 3. John 9, 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. The works of God. The, when we're doing works of God, when we're serving God, when we're ministering and we're in ministries that God calls us to be, and this is important, it's got to be what God wants, not what we want. But it's got to be what God wants. We're glorifying God. In the ministries that we serve in, that is glorifying God. 
John chapter 10, verse 38. John 10, 38. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So again, we see Jesus' works are focused on the Father. John chapter 11, verse 40. John chapter 11, verse 40. Jesus said there, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? See the glory of God. Do we still see miracles today? Do we still see miracles today? Yes. Yes? Anyone else? Do, what do you think? Do we still see miracles? I heard one yes. yes. Can you share with me a miracle that takes place today? <coughs> Pollination. I'm sorry? Pollination. Pollination, okay. Babies are being born every day. Babies are being born, okay. She read my mind again. She read your mind, okay. <laughs> you want to be careful, that's a dangerous thing. You want to be careful, that's a dangerous thing. Some of, the, some of those things God has set up his natural order and his power is revealed in it. Mm -hmm. Many things that we call miracles are God's providence. Mm -hmm. Somebody's showing up with the wrenches in hand when I have a mechanical need on a car. It's not a miracle, but it's God's providential care that he brought that person at that time. Mm -hmm. He's showing his sovereignty. But there are miracles when, when doctors diagnose individuals with cancer. They have a picture of that cancerous tumor and they go back for the final check before surgery and the tumor is gone. Yeah. Um, those are miraculous changes. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. I consider salvation a miracle too. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Do people today, they did it in Jesus' time, the apostles in Jesus' time. Do people today go around and place hands on people and it heals them? Does that happen today? Yes. You say yes. They claim to. They claim to, yes. They claim to. On the other hand, do we not see miracles through our prayer life when we pray for someone who has cancer and there's no hope and then all of a sudden they're healed? See, God still does miracles. He doesn't necessarily do them the way he did here. But he's still doing miracles. He is still doing miracles. Our God is a God of miracles. And we need to not forget that. He's operating. We're in a different dispensation now than here. All right? He operates differently now than he did here. But he still does miracles. He is a <coughs> God of miracles. As Jesus said regarding Lazarus' death, go to John chapter 11, verse 4. John chapter 11, verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So again, we see here, miracles are occurring here, but miracles are still occurring today. Miracles still occur today. And we need to not lose sight of that. Understand that our God is the same God today that he was here. He is the same. It's the same God. He is the same God. Even the events of Jesus' death and resurrection would result in the glory of the Son. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 23. John 12, 23. John 12, 23. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Drop down to 13, chapter 13, verse 32. John 13, 32. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Immediately. Glorify him. Glory that he has shared with the Father since eternity past. Go to Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1. Verse 1? Yep. John, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Drop down to verse 14. 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see here that God the Son and God the Father have the same glory. They share the same glory. It's not a different glory, it's the same glory. Hence, we have the Trinity. We're looking at two aspects of the Trinity. And as, as, as we go through this prayer in John chapter, John chapter 17, we're going to see the two aspects of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, actually communicating to each other, having a conversation, if you will, with each other. And you see that communication. But we see here clearly that this glory that the Father wants, the Son has the same. It's the same glory. They're two different individuals, but they're sharing the same glory. They have the same glory, and they've had it. This glory has been with them through all of eternity. This is not something that just happened. This is glory that God has had always through all of eternity. And that will be visibly displayed to the world at his future return. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, <clears throat> verse 27. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So the Son's returning, and the glory is going to be there. And that, oh, I'm sorry, go to Mark chapter 8, Gospel of Mark <laughs> chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The glory of his Father... Go to Luke chapter 21. Gospel of Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, verse 27. Luke 21, verse 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Glory. So... If we honor Jesus, if we bring glory to Jesus, are we glorifying the Father also? Yes. Absolutely. It's the same glory. They share the same glory. And you honor the Father, you're honoring the Son. You glorify the Father, you glorify the Son, and vice versa. Now, let me ask you this. If Jesus tells us to do something, and we do it, who are we glorifying? If Jesus, if Jesus, and, and let me be more clear. If Jesus calls you to go to Africa and to be a missionary, and you go to Africa and be a missionary, who are you glorifying when you do that? God. Okay. Can you break it down any more than that? Jesus. No. No. <laughs> well, I would say the Trinity. Well, when he says God, he's absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay, he's yeah. absolutely correct. There is one God, and that's true. So if you're, on a, if you're glorifying God, are you not glorifying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And so, not the whale. And, the, and what? And not the whale. Oh, not the whale. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> not the whale. Not the whale, yes, yes. So again, we see here, again, every aspect of our life should be about glorifying God. Everything we do. When we're here and we're listening to Pastor Larry's message, it's a message from God. And when we listen to it and when we apply it to our lives, we're glorifying God. We're glorifying God when we do these things. And there's when you pray and you, you're talking to God and you're sincere, it's sincere prayer and you're pouring out your heart, you are glorifying God when you do that. That's what God wants us to do. So every aspect of our life, we see here, every aspect of Jesus' life was about bringing glory to God. The same applies to us. Okay. 
It is fitting that his ministry would climax in a majestic prayer that emphasized the very thing that characterized his entire life, glorifying God. And as you go, we go through this prayer, you're going to see that over and over again, glorifying God, glorifying God, glorifying God. <clears throat> The theme of God's glory stated in verse 1 is echoed throughout this passage. So, you know, we've looked at John chapter 17, verse 1, and in that verse, first verse, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. That's the first verse, and it's throughout the entire prayer. That's, it's, the whole prayer is about glory, glorifying God. Just as the Son glorified the Father through his faithfulness on earth, go to John, well, John 17, let's quickly look at verse 4. John 17, 4, we'll, if we get there, we'll dig into it deeper. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So see, it wasn't about him, it was about the Father. What does the Father want? Glorifying the Father. So again, we see here, it's about glorifying the Father. Just as the Son glorified the Father through his faithfulness on earth, so the Father would glorify the Son together with himself with the very glory that the Son shared with him since before, the, before time began. Now, you're in 17.4, drop down to 17.5. O oh, now, O oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So see, that this glory, it's the same glory, and they've had it for all of eternity. And again, we see here, Jesus is focused on that. We also need to be focused on that, glorifying God. The disciples, too, would be those who glorified the Father by bringing glory to the Son. <laughs> John chapter 17, jump down to verse 10. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So we see here clearly, all right, Jesus says, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine. So it's the same, and then he says, and I am glorified in them. So if he's glorified in them, the Father is glorified in them, because they're sharing the same thing, it's, that it belongs to each of them. They, along with all who would believe in the Son, would share in his glory. John chapter 17, drop down to verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now we're dealing with us, all believers. We're dealing with us, all believers. All right? So we are also, by being believers, by being a local body, we're glorifying God. We're glorifying God. By being here this morning, we're glorifying God. By when we sing, when we pray, we're glorifying God. Our actions are glorifying God. Eternally praising Him for the glory that He received from the Father. John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So again, we see here this glory they shared long before we ever came about. Long before we ever came about. I don't know if y'all have ever heard this, but I've heard this, so I want to ask you a question. Is God vain in wanting all this glory? No. Is God vain in wanting all this glory? Why not? Because he's worthy of it. Ah. So, are there any humans? Let's just talk about our time period right here that we live in today. Or if you want to bring up something in the past, that's fine. But in human history, have there been any humans that wanted glory that truly deserved it? Can you think of any humans... Not discounting Jesus Christ. Okay, discounting Jesus Christ. Any humans that sought glory or even received glory that were truly worthy of it. What do you think? Any humans throughout human history that sought glory or received glory that were truly worthy of it. I don't believe if you seek glory that you're ever going to get glory. 
Okay, okay. In human eyes, you would get it. Would you agree with that statement? In human eyes, you would get that glory. Would you all agree with that statement? Or disagree with it? If you disagree with it, speak out. I agree, I agree with it, because it says, he that humbles himself will be exalted. But there's people that are proud that get all kinds of things here that will mm -hmm. not later. Yes, yes. So would you say humans that are seeking glory, they're vain? Yes. Would you agree with that? But God is not vain, and that's important to understand. Now, why is it important for us to glorify God? Why is that important? So that he can give us glory. Okay, that's true. And what happens when we get glory? We glorify God. Okay. It's a circle. Yes, it is. <laughs> You've got a nice circle going there. But there is a reason. It's, it, it, there is a logical, if you will, reason for us to glorify God. It's in our best interest. Right thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's in our best interest to glorify God. God wants us to glorify Him because that's what's best for us. It's best for us to glorify Him. And, and I mean, what's the alternative to glorifying God? Being away from God. Being away from God. Who would you glorify if you're not glorifying God? What other choices are there? Glorifying Satan. Yeah. He ain't worth it. And it is not in our best interest to glorify Satan, but it is in our best interest to glorify God. It is in our best interest to glorify God. Can anyone share with me what is in our best interest in glorifying God? Why is it in our best interest be to glorify to God? God? I'm sorry? To be closer to God. To be closer to God, okay. A stronger relationship with Him. Stronger relationship with Him, okay. Anyone else? Why is it in our best interest? <clears throat> Why is it in our best interest to glorify God? A witness to others. Okay, witness to others. Okay, and what does that benefit them? Bring them to the Lord. Okay, okay, ah, okay, so it's in our best interest to glorify Him because that brings us to Him. And what do we get by coming to Him? Everlasting life. With Everlasting him. life. All that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Exactly. It is in our best interest to glorify God. What does God give us in return? Eternal life with Him. A relationship with Him forever. 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 That's why it's in our best interest to glorify God. If you glorify Satan, what do you get? If you glorify Satan, what do you get? In trouble. In trouble. That's a fact. In trouble. Yes. Yes. But you get death. Damnation. You get death. With God, you get life. With Satan, you get death. It is in our best interest to glorify God. And he's worthy. Keep that in mind. He is worthy. He is definitely worthy. Furthermore, the plan of salvation would certainly be fulfilled in the cross since God's glorious reputation, his name, was at stake. When God says he's going to do something, can we trust him that he's going to do it? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. God takes his reputation very seriously. He takes it very seriously. We should do the same thing. We should take our reputation very seriously. God does, we should. The prayer itself falls readily into three sections. As Jesus prays for himself, you'll see that in verses 1 through 5, his disciples in verses 6 through 19, and his church in verses 20 through 26. But throughout all three sections, the focal point is the glory of God being manifested through the cross. I want to share something here. This is from John MacArthur. This is by a man named James Montgomery Boyce, and he, he, this is his comment that he makes. This prayer contains the simplest of sentences, through the ideas are pro, though the ideas are profound. It is proof 
But the difficulty we have in understanding God's truth is not in the complexity of the truth itself or in the language with which it is conveyed, as if it were logarithms or German philosophy, but in our own ignorance, sin, and spiritual lethargy. So when we come across scripture and we don't understand it, do we have access to God to find out what the answer is? Absolutely. So if there's something we don't understand, we have access to understanding. We have access to understanding. He will not leave us in the dark. Ironically, it was through the cross, the most shameful of deaths, that the Son of God displayed infinite glory. Infinite glory. Now, it's interesting that, that would you think that, that a man hanging on a tree and brutally, brutally beat up as Jesus was, that that would bring glory to him? The, the Roman soldiers didn't see him having any glory. The, Ro the Jewish people at the time didn't see him having any glory. But God saw it as glory. God saw it as glory. So what does that say to us in our lives? What does that say to us in our lives? He can take any situation that appears bad to us and turn it for good. Okay. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Anything else? Anything else? What does that speak to us in our lives? Anyone? We can trust him. Absolutely, we can trust him. Absolutely, yes. Anyone else? Do not judge what you do to glorify God by the world's standards. Because what the world will think is foolishness, God will say, this brings me glory and honor. And that needs to be our focus. What brings glory and honor to God? Not what does the world say brings glory and honor to God, but what does God say brings glory and honor to Him? Because I guarantee you, um, there are people out there that, that think that praying is a waste of time. They truly think praying is a waste of time. There are people out there, and I mean, I run into this all the time, they'll, they'll give me this problem they have, and I'll say, well, the answer is Jesus. And they're like, you think Jesus is the answer to everything? And it's like, yes, Jesus is the answer to everything. You need to understand that. Jesus is the answer to everything. I don't care what your problem is, Jesus is the answer. And you go to him, you surrender him, you give your life and allow him to work things out. But he is the answer. So again, we can't use the world's definition. We have to use God's definition. Do what he wants us to do. What seemed to be the worst possible outcome for Jesus, at least in the minds of his disciples, was in reality his ultimate victory. Now remember, what did the, what did the apostles think when Jesus died? What did they think? Hopelessness. Hopelessness. All was lost. <laughs> They're like, man, I can't believe we gave up everything and look where we're at now. Look where we're at now. They did not understand what was actually taking place. And, and that's the world's problem. When the world sees us doing things and they think we're crazy and we're like, this is glorifying God and they think we're nuts, they don't see what's really taking place. We should be seen as Christians. We see not with eyes that the world uses, but with holy eyes, with eyes that God has. By looking at the cross from the standpoint of God's glory, the Lord saw triumph where his followers saw nothing but tragedy. Nothing but tragedy. <laughs> Jesus' prayer... <laughs> i got to get this so I can read it. Jesus' prayer highlights his absolute confidence and submission to the perfect will of God, even though he knew perfectly what it would cost him. What it would cost him. Hopefully, none of us will face a situation 
like what Jesus is facing right now, where we have to face a horrible death, and that horrible death will glorify God. But that's a decision some of us may have to make at some point in time. I don't know what the future holds for us, but some of us may actually have to make that choice. Face a death that will bring glory and honor to God, but it's going to hurt. It's going to be extremely painful for us. That's a decision we have to make. That's a decision that Jesus made. And remember, when I, we're not just talking pain, physical pain here for Jesus. Remember, we've talked about this before. This fact that he was going to be separated from the Father, that, that's what he was praying about in the garden. That had never happened throughout all of eternity. The Father and Son had never been separated. Jesus did not want that to happen. But it's what the Father wanted, and he was willing to go through that. We may face the same thing in our lives. Each and every one of us may face the same thing in our lives. We have to be ready for that. Therefore, he prayed that the Father's will would be done, that the Master's plan of redemption would be accomplished, and that the Father would bring to reality all the promises he had made to his disciples. Now, again, what's interesting is you go through the prayer, you'll, um, this prayer in chapter 17, you'll see this. Jesus is depending on God the Father to make all this happen. He's not depending on himself. He has to depend on the Father. And when, when we get into this prayer, you'll see this, but there's, uh, there's a point in time in all of this that we look at that when Jesus dies, all right, he goes to hell, if you will, Hades, wherever you want to call it. He has no control over what's going on here on earth. He leaves it in the Father's hands to make sure that his apostles are protected and that everything they planned is carried out. It's the Father that Jesus is leaning on to get this done. He's totally depending on the Father to do this. You'll see that in the prayer here. Knowing the will of God did not cause Jesus to fatalistically forego praying. And again, that's another thing. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen. He's God. He knew everything, but he still prayed. He still prayed. He didn't just take it for granted. Oh, that's God's will, so I don't got to worry about it. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. And we, got, again, another example for us. Don't take a fatalistic approach. Well, whatever God wants, that's what's going to happen. That's the wrong attitude to have. That's a wrong attitude to have. Yes, sir. I'm having a problem with the separation. Okay. So Jesus, Jesus knew that when he died on that cross, he was going to be separated from his father. Mm -hmm. um, is is that is that what we will go through? We'll be separated from the father. No. Until so we we'll, we we won't experience that. So he was he was separated from the father and went to hell. Hades and, con and conquered. And, yes. And was resurrected. Yes. But I'm having issues with the separation thing. Okay. Remember. What happens when a sinner dies? He's, he's, he's judged. Okay, and, but what happens? Right now, all human beings have the ability to connect with God. Right. All right. When a sinner dies, what happens? Well, we're all sinners. But uh, an <laughs> unbeliever, all right, when an unbeliever dies, okay. uh, when an unbeliever dies, what happens? He, he goes to hell. Okay, but what happens? All right, you got to what does separation. death what exactly separated from God forever? Right. We have life. But, but we're you're guaranteed about that. Who doesn't have a relationship with God anyway. Yes, right? but what was Jesus? Why was Jesus on the cross? And right. what happened to him? That's right. right. He paid the penalty, so we don't have to pay the penalty. What's the penalty of death? Separation. So now again, understand it wasn't something that you know for unbelievers it goes on forever, but for Jesus it wasn't forever. Right. But that moment on the cross, that separate, and again, you must understand, Jesus has a relationship with the Father that's totally different than anything we have. It's much more intimate than anything we have. Well, it never wasn't, right? Yeah, it's it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, it was always very, very intimate. Oh, okay. I'm out of the camera. Sorry about that. But again, again, see, understand? I mean, can you? I mean, I can't think of anything to really help us understand, but imagine, imagine, if you will, that you and your wife always knew what each other was thinking. 
Now, granted, in our case, that would be a bad thing. But I mean, <laughs> but I mean, imagine that kind of intimacy that you always knew what she was thinking and she always knew what you were thinking. That's what the father and the son have. Now, that's an intimacy that none of us understand or can really truly comprehend because none of us have ever experienced that. But that's what the father and son have. That kind of intimacy, and it was severed on the cross. It was gone. He was no longer in connection with the father. And he did not want that. He did not want that. I hope, did I help you? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, and we've run out of time. We'll pick this up next week. Thoughts, questions, or comments? Anyone at all before I close this in prayer? Anyone at all? All right. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this gift of eternal life that you've given us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, help each and every one of us to value this relationship we have. Help us, Lord, to grow in this relationship we have. Help us now, Lord, as we go into the sanctuary, help us to sing to you, help us to pray to you, help us to hear the message that you have for us, help us to understand it, and help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that everyone that walks in those doors today, when they walk out those doors, they are closer to you when they walked in those doors. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.